the committee, her thesis uh, that has been supervised by Cristobal Lopez and Emilio Hernández. And this uh, dissertation is going to be recorded, as you have noticed already. And the members of the committee uh, are Dr. Ismael Hernández Carrasco, who works uh, at SOCIF in uh, uh, Balearic Island. Also, uh, it is going to be a vocal of the committee, uh, Dr. Uh, Joao Betencourt, who works in the Geophysical Institute at the University of Bergen in Norway. And um, finally, uh, I am going to be also a member of the committee. My name is Ana Maria Mancho. I work in the Institute of Mathematical Science at the SIC in, in Madrid. So, Rebecca, welcome. And it is your turn now to present your thesis. You know that you have between 45, 60 minutes to present your, your work. And afterwards, we will start with a ton of questions. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, um, good morning to everybody. Um, so yes, I'm going to present you the work I have developed during my PhD program. So first of all, I would like to thank you, my thesis supervisors, Cristobal Lopez and Demi Hernández, for supporting to me during all this time. Actually, at some point, I thought that it was never going to end, but here we are. So. I'm going to talk to you about the transport of sinking particles from a Lagrangian point of view, that is following the pathways of particles as they move by a given flow. And in particular, we have developed a theoretical characterization to analyze the vertical transport of particles, and we have applied it into specific regions of the ocean. So I will start with a brief introduction where we will see what are we interested in, why is important this work, and which methods we use for uh, reach the proposes. Next, we will continue by looking at the main results from our work where we have analyzed the vertical distribution and dispersion properties of particles that sink from the ocean surface in the Mediterranean Sea. Then we will continue by looking at the theoretical characterization uh, where we characterize the vertical transport of particles. And in particular, we will see its application into the analytical ABC flow and into a realistic flow in the Canary Islands. And finally, we will end with the main conclusions and perspectives arising from this work. So we are interested in the transport of particles that seen from the ocean surface. And we distinguish between two different particles types, depending on their source and fate. From one side, we consider biogenic particles such as plankton, fecal pellets, and marine snow, because as you may know, uh, these particles play a key role in the biogeophysical pro um, processes that sustain life. For example, the, the biological carbon pump. On the other hand, we also consider polluting materials such as microplastics, which is becoming a key environmental problem. In both cases, we are interested in answering questions such, uh, well, which are the processes that are involved in the motion of these um, particles? Which are the equation of motions that applies to each case study? Or at which extent the physical properties of the particles um, modulate the dynamics of the particles? And this is important because uh, most of the information we have about the transport of particles in the ocean is almost restricted to the ocean surface. And this is because there is a limitation in collecting data at deep waters. So we need models to address uh, such, um, such a problem or such um, uh, the different processes that are involved, right? And uh, in this case or in this work, what we do is to use concepts from dynamical systems and network theory and analyze the, the transport of particles that travel between two different depths along the water column. So we defined um, horizontal cross sections along the water column of the ocean, and we characterize the transport properties of the particles as they sink from a, from a given layer to a deeper one. 
Okay, so now we look to look at the main results about the transport of microplastics in the Mediterranean Sea. And what happens is that most of the plastic is positively buoyant. So it was initially thought that it remains floating on the ocean surface, but actually only 1% of the, of the plastic that ends into the ocean remains on the ocean surface. And well, uh, we can ask ourselves, so where is all the plastic? And the point is that once this material is in this aquatic environment, then it starts to degrade and to be fragmented into very small pieces. And then there are different processes that are involved in the transport of this material. For example, um, the beaching or biofouling, or it is ingested by mic microorganisms, or it sinks and ends as a sediment in the, in the bottom. Um, well, in this work, uh, we do not consider the interaction of particles with the environment. Uh, so we consider particles to be independent to each other. And the motivation for this uh, case study is that it is observed that particles distribute along the water column according to their density. So we consider among the different uh, microplastic types, uh, those that are negatively buoyant rich in microplastics. And from this theoretical framework, so we consider the particles um, from, a, yeah, from a theoretical point of view. So we consider them to be of a spherical shape. And uh, we take into account the finite size effects of the, of the particles. So this means that we consider the, the size and density to be the crucial properties of the particles that modulate the dynamics. So the first thing that we do is to look at the relevant uh, properties of the microplastics, as I have said, according to their size and density. So on the figure here on the left, we can see that um, we, have the, we have identified uh, from different studies, the typical range of the density of the, the, the range of the density of the particles for uh, each uh, polymer type. And these ranges are compared to the seawater density, which in the ocean is estimated to be at uh, 1,025 kilograms per cubic meter. So we finally identified the range of the typical um, polymer types to be at 1,025 and 1,400 kilograms per cubic meter. On the other hand, we also um, uh, look at the size of particles. And from previous studies, it was observed that there is an increase in abundance of particles with decreasing sizes. So we fix the particles radius to be at 0 0.05 millimeters, for which we consider that uh, it, it um, represents well most of the particles present in the ocean. Now we go to look at the dynamics that, um, that represents well the dynamics of these uh, particle types. So we start from the simplified maxillary cutting goal equation which um, um, uh, where we can, uh, it is uh, described in terms of, of B, which is the velocity of the particle, U, which is the velocity of the external flow. And we have three different terms involved in this equation. From one side, we have buoyancy, which compares the particle's density to that of the fluid. And Beta actually has uh, values less than one for those particles that are negatively buoyant. And it has positive va value, uh, po uh, values greater than one for particles that are positively buoyant. We have also the other term, the Stokes time, which is the response times for a particle to respond to changes in the external flow. And it is described in terms of the radius of the particle, A, beta, the buoyancy, and the kinematic viscosity. And finally, the other term in both the dynamics is the cycling velocity, which is the, um, the velocity pointing down, down, downwards. 
And well, yeah, the setting velocity uh, depends on the two previous uh, terms, the buoyancy, the stock times, and also on the gravity constant. But what happens that happens that this equation actually is a first approximation of the more fundamental equation. Uh, so to be fulfilled, uh, we have two different conditions. From one side, um, the Reynolds number of the particle has to be much smaller than one. And on the other hand, the particle's radius has to be uh, smaller than the cosmography scale of the flow, which in the ocean is estimated to be about 0 0.3 and two millimeters. So we look at the parameter range of the particles for which uh, the equation is valid. For doing so, we plot here in this figure, uh, on the vertical we plot, uh, we show the settling velocity and on the horizontal, the radius of the particle. And we want to identify the, um, the range for which the, um, the equation is valid, right? So what we do is to look at these uh, two different conditions that has to be fulfilled. So from one side, we uh, show the, the line, uh, the curve, um, where the corresponds to the values for which the Reynolds number of the particle is equal to one. And we also show the line, um, which is an upper bound of the cosmography scale of the flow. So we conclude that the dust region corresponds to the, to the parameter range for which the equation is valid. And we also look at another upper bound corresponding to the, or associated to the properties of the particles for the typical microplastics. So what we do is to look, uh, because we have identified the range of the, um, the densities of the particle for the typical microplastics, um, we compare it to the fluid density and we, we observe that the beta parameter is in between 0 0.8 and 1. So a, a, a beta value of 0 0.8 is an upper bound uh, to the typical microplastics, negatively buoyant microplastics. So we finally identify this darker region, which corresponds to the, the parameter range for which um, the equation is valid and uh, that is typical for microplastics. So, okay, we finally, finally can say that the settling velocity uh, for microplastics is smaller than 0 0.01 meters per second. And also that the particles radio, radius is smaller than 0 0.3 millimeters. Okay, so now we um, perform the simulation by using data from Nemo, the NEMO model, uh, for which the data has been provided by the research group of Eric Van Seville in the University of Utrecht. And we used uh, the oceanic variables from this model and released this number of particles that are uniformly distributed at one meter depth. So we integrate the particles um, from this uh, releasing layer, and we um, um, then uh, will use some concepts to analyze the, the properties of the, tra uh, the transport properties of the particles. And for the parameters of the particles are uh, fixed, um, according to the, to the ranges that are observed, right? Okay, so now we go deep, uh, deeper to uh, look at the contribution of the different terms involved in the dynamics. So starting from the simplify maximum cutting all equation, we can even uh, simplify more the dynamics because we are working on very small particles. So the stock's number is very small. This means that we can uh, do an expansion of this equation and we get the, the expression that we have on the right, which is basically uh, for which the, um, the velocity of the particle is expressed is in terms of the external flow, the settling velocity and inertia. So what we do is to break down this equation into the different terms in both the dynamics and we um, compare 
the, the dynamical properties of each equation or compare the, the yeah, some dynamical properties uh, by comparing the different uh, equations. We, for doing so, what we do is to uh, first um, fix this equation as a reference one, um, which is the simplest one, right? Because the, here the velocity of the particle depends on the external flow and the centering velocity. So using this uh, reference equation, we add different terms into the equation. Uh, and then, uh, okay, we have uh, this first equation, which adds inertia and Coriolis. The second equation, which adds uh, Gaussian white noise in order to compute the unresolved small scales. And we also take into account in the, this final equation, a variable fluid density. So we want to compare these equations. And for doing so, what we do is to integrate uh, the particles from each equation and with identical initial conditions. Um, and the criteria that we use to determine if the, ter the different terms are negligible or not is to look at the distance between particles when integrated from the reference equation and the other ones. Um, this is what uh, we, I described here in the formula on the right. So this uh, distance between particles at a, at a given time is compared to the total distance traveled by particles. And from these results, we finally um, can say that the inertia and Coriolis are negligible terms to the dynamics. Uh, for the unresolved small scales, what we find is that, uh, okay, we have larger deviations, uh, which are moderate, but still are enough to, to, to extract the transport properties uh, of the largest, uh, the largest scale properties of the flow or of the motion of particles in this case. And finally, the variable fluid density uh, also shows deviations, uh, large deviations, but are of the order of the unresolved small scale. So as a conclusion, uh, we can say that the dynamics of the typical microplastics can, uh, can be approximated by the uh, simply uh, sim simple equ this equation uh, for which the flow velocity, the particle velocity, is described in terms of the external flow and the centering velocity. Okay, so now we go to look at the amount of uh, microplastic that is present in the water column. And for doing this estimation, we first uh, look at the distribution of particles along the water column. So, as I said before, uh, we do a single release event from one meter depth. So from this uh, simulation, we look at the particles positions at each time, and we compute the density of uh, the, the, the density of particles at each depth. And we compare this density to the area of the Mediterranean. And as we can observe, these two functions are mostly identical. So we can, we can say that, okay, um, particles distribute along the water column uniformly. And we use this uh, assumption to, or this result, to estimate the total amount of negatively buoyant rigid microplastic. And for doing so, we, define the residence time, which is the time that a particle spend, spends along the water column. And this residence times uh, is described uh, by using H, which represents the average of the bottom floor and the settling velocity of the particle. So for estimating the residence time, we do a, a wellhead average by taking into account the different uh, polymer types that are present in the, in the ocean. 
And we finally get that this average is about 14 days. This means that particles spend 14 days until they reach the, the bottom as an average. And now, in order to quantify the total amount of microplastic, uh, we uh, use uh, the we take the rate at which microplastics enter into, into the water column. But because we are interested in 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 the open ocean, we focus on particles that come from maritime activity. And this rate, which is estimated from other studies, uh, is estimated to be about uh, 0 0.24 tons per year. So we uh, use this rate and the days that particles are spent in the water column. And finally, we estimate that the total uh, amount of microplastic present in the water column at, it in, at any time is 3.36 tons. So, okay, uh, the main conclusions of this part of the work is that Coriolis and inertial terms are negligible to the dynamics. Also that the large scale flow dynamics are robust to small scale fluctuations and also to the seawater variability. So the equation of motion finally can be simplified by adding a constant set in term to the external flow. Also, the equation of motion results in a nearly uniform distribution along the water column. And the total amount of microplastics present in the water column is close to 1% of the floating plastic mass in the Mediterranean. So it may be an important contribution to the microplastic pollution in the, at, deep, at deep layers. And also, although it's not shown here, we have also observed transient vertical distribution that deviates from Gaussian. Uh, which is uh, associated to anomalous diffusive loads that dominate at different uh, phases, um, yes, at, at, in different phases. Okay, so now we go to look at the theoretical characterization that characterizes the, the vertical transport of particles. So the general idea or the focus is to look at the skeleton of transport of particles as they travel between two given layers. And we first uh, take uh, the geometrical approach from concepts of dynamical systems. And what we uh, what do is to identify uh, regions with different dynamical behavior, uh, which are separated by um, structures that act as a repelling and mixing uh, structures. And a common approach for doing so is uh, by computing the finite time Lyapun of exponent. So um, this is performed by taking a Lagrangian description of the flow. So we follow the particles, uh, the trajectory of the particles as they move by the flow. And we can compute the flow map which gives for a, um, an initial particle, it gives the final position of the particle after a given integration time tau. So the singular values of this Jacobian matrix, of the Jacobian matrix of this flow map, uh, gives the stretching factors of infinitesimal material lines. So if we imagine a sphere, an initial sphere, in an incompressible flow with chaotic advection, then we will find that with time, uh, the material is, is stretching in one in, uh, direction while contracted in other ones. So these singular values or the maximal singular value actually corresponds to the stretching rate of the material in the direction of maximal growth. So this is the, the, the maximal stretching factor that is used to compute the finite value of exponents, which finally uh, gives, the expo gives the exponent of the exponential growth rate of lines, of infinitesimal lines. So we use this um, concept and we extend it to the case of particles that travel between two layers. So in our approach or in our characterization, we release particles from an initial layer and we integrate them until they reach um, a second layer. So we define M to be the, this initial layer. 
and we define the two layer map, which uh, gives for an initial particle in the releasing layer, uh, the two layer map gives the final position of the particle when it reaches the second layer. And we also defined omega as the time that particle spends traveling between these two layers. Next, we define the Jacobian of this two layer map and compute the singular values. So the singular values in this case uh, are associated to the stretching rates of, of material lines uh, once uh, the lines reach the, the second layer. And this is the, the maximal uh, singular value is uh, used to define the finite depth Lyapunov of exponent, which is a measure that we have defined to characterize the, the formation of fluid uh, materials that travel between two layers. So, okay, uh, we can also describe this, this uh, process by um, looking at an initial surface um, surface layer in the in the releasing layer and by looking at the deformation of the surface as it, is, as it is affected by the flow and when it is projected on the onto the collecting layer so as we can observe uh, actually the whole process uh, can be uh, described as the contribution of two different processes. One is the stretching of the, of the surface uh, by the flow, right? So we can expect that uh, the surface it, uh, suffers a deformation uh, when it is affected by the flow. So we define the stretching factor as the stretching rate of this uh, surface at a given time. And once the, the surface reaches the second layer, um, uh, the other process that is involved is the projection of the surface onto the collecting layer, which finally results in a footprint of points. Um, so the, the projection factor measures the, um, the projection of the surface onto the collecting layer. Okay, these two different contributions um, can actually be described in terms of what we call the density factor. Um, the density factor then is defined as the ratio of the density of particles uh, in a release uh, layer uh, surface, in an, in an initial surface, and its image in the collecting layer. This means that uh, if the surface has the same, uh, the same number of particles when reaching the collecting layer, then the density factor is defined as the inverse ratio of the areas, the areas of the initial and final surface. Okay, so uh, now we go to the network approach. The, the, previous, the previous ones uh, take, take concepts from dynamical systems. And now we um, perform, um, and, um, we look at the uh, properties of the transport from concepts of network theory. So we discretize the domain into regular boxes, not the domain, actually the, the two layers, sorry, into regular boxes. And we uh, compute the transport matrix, which gives the links between two boxes. Um, between two boxes. So here the links connect boxes that uh, between uh, the releasing and collecting layer. So for a box in the releasing layer, a link uh, to another box in the collecting layer gives the proportion of fluids that uh, is mapped onto the onto the box in the collecting layer. And this transport matrix has a probabilistic interpretation. So from this transport matrix, we um, compute different measures that characterize the transport. The first thing that we do is to use the adjacency matrix, which is the binary version of the transport matrix. And from here, we compute the out degree of a node. 
The out degree is defined for nodes that uh, are located in the releasing layer. And it, it gives the total number of boxes in the collecting layer that uh, have some fluid content or reach uh, for which uh, some fluid content reaches uh, this this uh, collecting layer. Um, so it is the, the sorry the degree out is the number of boxes in the collecting layer receiving some fluid from the box in the releasing layer. And on the other hand, the in degree uh, is defined for each box in the releasing layer. And it is defined as, as the number of boxes in the releasing layer from which some fluid content will reach the box in the collecting layer. And finally, the network entropy is uh, an alternative version to the degree out, but by taking into account the weight of the links. And finally, also inside the network approach, uh, we are interested in identifying uh, regions of different dynamical behavior. So for doing so, we uh, want um, that two different conditions has to be fulfilled. One is that, okay, we, we want to find such regions that are um, isolated, but also with high internal mixing. So for the proposed, um, we, Look at this. Um, we look at the community structure at each level independently uh, to each other, uh, and for doing so, we compute. Uh, we have defined these two one-mode matrices, which are actually the projection of the transport matrix onto each given layer. So the M out uh, is the projection onto the releasing layer. And it gives the a link in the links uh, in this matrix uh, connects boxes in the releasing layer, and a link gives the amount of fluid density uh, from these two boxes that collect the same uh, fluid density uh, in the collecting layer. On the other hand, M in defines links between boxes in the collecting layer, where a link uh, gives the amount of fluid density. Uh, coming from identical locations in the releasing layer. So these two matrices are used to uh, run the InfoMap algorithm uh, from which we uh, identify the community structure. And finally, we have derived um, a heuristic relationship between the geometrical and network approaches. From one side, we have the that the stretching factor is also is related to the product of the stretching factors of, of the two-layer map. On the other hand, the degree out is related to the maximal uh, singular uh, singular value, and for the network entropy is related to the to the logarithm of the of the maximal uh, singular value. And in all cases, uh, the network approach is related to the dynamical, to the to the geometrical point of view, by uh, performing um, coarse graining of the of the of the of the layers, and we compute uh, the average of the values of the stretching factors at each box. Okay, so. Uh, what happens is that these relations are fulfilled, but with some uh, assumptions. The first one is that we are working in a three-dimensional flow, where uh, not all, uh, not only one direction can be uh, experiencing expansion. So we can have more than one direction that uh, that um, that stretches. Uh, so one condition that we have to take into account is that, okay, in such cases in where we have uh, more than one uh, growing direction, we have also to take it into account into the, into the measure. Uh, but even if we take into account this, um, we need also uh, sufficiently hyperbolic dynamics. 
Okay, so now we apply this theoretical characterization to the ABC flow. So what we do is to um, add um, um, a constant uh, velocity contribution in the in the in the vertical d uh, to force particle to travel in a preferential direction, and we also set uh, periodic boundary conditions in the horizon. And because this flow is uh, time independent, we have that the two layer map actually here is one to one. Okay, so the first thing that we do is to uh, look at the uh, at the, uh, the time uh, that particles spend traveling between the two layers. So we release uh, the a, a number of particles homogeneously distributed in the releasing layer, and we stop them when they reach the second layer. Um, and in this figure here, we look at this partial distribution of this uh, um, um, time that particles spend traveling. And uh, we also compute the distribution of this time, omega. And what we observe is that there are two different regimes. Um, the first one um, uh, for which the particles reach very fast the second layer is characterized by a, a laminar uh, um, motion. On the other hand, we also identify another region um, for which the particles uh, spend more time traveling uh, until reaching the second layer and which is characterized by a more chaotic motion. Uh, we compute the finite de uh, depth Lyap one of exponent in this ABC flow uh, by varying the, um, the, um, the collecting layer, or in other words, by increasing the depth between layers. So what we observe is that as we increase the vertical distance between layers, we find a finer a, a filamentary structure. And it is, it's uh, important to note that these structures um, are associated to separatrices, or in other words, um, they act as a repelling structures of particles as they uh, travel between the two layers. So if we imagine two particles at both sides of the, of the separatrix, then uh, the distance uh, between particles will diverge when reaching the second layer. This is important because uh, the finite depth Lyapunov one of exponent actually is given is giving a measure of the structures um, that uh, are hidden in the, in the transport. Um, but of course, associated to the transport of particles between these two layers. Okay, we also compute the geometric factors. Uh, the, from one side, we compute the density factor, the, the stretching factor, and the projection factor. And a qualitative comparison um, show us that, okay, the effect of stretching is less determinant to the density factor than the projection factor. And on the other hand, we can also observe that the stretching factor and the projection factor have some uh, anti-correlation. Um, from the network characterization, we also compute the out degree. Um, in the, in the releasing layer and the in degree in the collecting layer. And the out degree is compared to the uh, finite depth Lyap one of exponent and also to the network entropy. And we can observe qualitatively that both measures uh, show the same structures. But a more quantitative uh, quantification of this relationship is shown here on the right, where uh, we uh, I, I show you the the, the out degree depending on the on the um, maximal stretching rate, 
And what we observe is that, okay, there is a correlation between both measures, but we have some deviations from, from, from identity. And the reason is that uh, we have not enough hyperbolicity uh, in the dynamics to, uh, to, to approach the identity. Uh, but if we take into account the weight of the links by, by measuring, uh, by computing uh, the relationship between the network, and, uh, the network entropy and the logarithm of the stretching rates, then we observe that, okay, the identity is uh, almost uh, approached except at, uh, at these um, points where uh, there is not uh, sufficiently uh, hyperbolic dynamics, hyperbolicity. Okay. And we also uh, look at the relationship between the in strength and the density factor, or in, in other words, uh, we compute the density factor um, described in terms of the, of the stretching rates. And we compare it to the um, to the in the strength um, from the network um, approach, and we observe that both quantities are nearly equal. So um, okay, we have that both relationships um, are um, well correlated. As a conclusion of this part, we can say that we have developed a formalist to characterize transport of particles between the two layers. We have also used two different approaches, the geometrical from concepts of dynamical systems, and also the probabilistic, uh, which uses concepts from network theory, and which both concepts, uh, both approaches are heuristically related. Also, a novel measure defined by the of exponent has been defined to identify the skeleton of motion between layers. And finally, this formalism is developed to identify network communities associated to the two layer map. So finally, we apply it into the Canary Islands. So we use data from the model ROMs, uh, from which the data is provided by Evan Masson. And the first thing that we do is to uh, compute the distribution of the vertical velocity of the flow. And we identify um, the value that uh, is located at the percentile 95 of this distribution, uh, which is uh, minus uh, 20 meters per day. So we use this value as an upper bond to, um, to fix, uh, to determine the upper bonds for uh, certain velocities. Uh, in order to get the particles to uh, travel in a preferential direction of motion. So we uh, simulate particles uh, starting at uh, uh, 100 meters depth, and we use three different setting velocities. So one uh, thing that we do is to uh, compute the, the devolution of different depth, the upon of exponents, um, um, we compute the funny depth upon of exponent at each month. And we look at this temporal evolution and we uh, find that there is a one year seasonal cycle of the funny depth upon of exponent, which is uh, anti correlated to the sea surface temperature. This means that, uh, for example, at February, where we have uh, higher values of the funny depth upon of exponent, um, we have uh, minimum uh, temperatures of water. Also, this funny that the upon of exponent is compute for each month uh, for, for the different seasons. And what we find is that in summer and autumn, there is a predominance of big vortices around the Canary Islands. And on the other hand, in winter, there is an increase of um, vortices that predominate along the coastline. Finally, we um, use the community structure of this two-layer map by computing the InfoMap algorithm from the transport matrix. Actually, the two one-mode matrices computed from the transport matrix. So for doing so, we uh, use uh, three different um, uh, setting velocities in order to compare the community structure depending on, on, this, um, on this parameter. So the uh, a first level uh, outcome of the algorithm um, 
shows that there is um, a partition of the domain into two regions that are separated by the Canary Islands. Um, but okay, the absence of other communities uh, may be indicative that um, that the data is biased to uh, because of the presence of the of the islands. So we performed a second level of the algorithm, which uh, looks for the communities that are present inside the communities in the first level. And what we observe here is that okay. Uh, by increasing the settling velocity, we do not find a um, general structure of, of, of the communities. So, okay, this is one conclusion, but also this is one interesting thing that we find, uh, and is that if we observe the communities, they are elongated in offshore direction. So this may be indicative that about the, the lateral export of particles, uh, in offshore direction. We also have compute the qual uh, some quality parameters that uh, we have defined for this uh, two-layer map. And okay, um, the, qual the quality parameters and uh, are compute for uh, by uh, when increasing the vertical distance between layers. And the first quality parameters, which is the number of communities. Uh, we find that, okay, as we increase the distance between layers, we find uh, a, la a lower number of communities. Also, the global coherence of communities uh, decreases for increasing vertical distance. And the global mixing, on the other hand, increases for increasing vertical distances. Uh, these uh, trends is what we expected. So, so this is informative that, okay, we have um, a formalis that works well for identifying the community structure. So as a conclusion, we can say that the finite depth Lyapunov of exponent organize the horizontal layers into regions of different dynamical behavior. And also that this finite deadly upon of exponent shows one year seasonality with a higher dispersion rates in winter. Also, there is some more filamentary structures appearing for increasing vertical velocities and for slower particles. And as always not shown here, uh, we have also checked the relationship between the, the, the network approach and the geometrical one. And uh, we show a good uh, relationship. And finally, communities, uh, the communities that we find present an elongated shape, shape in offshore direction, which may be indicative of the lateral uh, transport of particles. So as a conclusion um, of this work, we can say that Okay, we have analyzed the vertical distribution and dispersion properties of microplastics in the Mediterranean Sea, where we have found that for typical microplastics, the dynamics can be simplified by adding a constant set return to the external flow. Also that particles distribute uniformly along the vertical column, from which uh, we have estimated the total amount of microplastics present in the water column. Also, we have found um, that there is a weak vertical dispersion, but the emergence of transient vertical distributions that deviates from Gaussianity, which are related to anomalous diffusive behaviors. We have also developed a formalis to analyze the vertical transport of particles by using two different approaches, the geometrical uh, and the probabilistic from concepts of network theory. And both approaches have, have been heuristically related to each other. Also, a novel measure defining the idea of exponent has been defined to quantify the skeleton of motion specific to this two-layer map. And as a perspective, I would say that this theoretical framework may provide new insights into the study of transport structures of particles that travel in a preferential direction. So this will be relevant for studies of sedimentation and for the identification of regions of interest, such, for example, highly polluted regions or with high primary uh, primary uh, activity. And finally, this formalis uh, will also relevant to analyze dispersion properties and the global properties of, of the transport of particles along the water column. Thank you.
Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for your very nice presentation.